Institute for Pure and Applied Knowledge, also known as IPAC. He has written three books, one on Ebola, and another on curves versus profits, and a third on environmental and genetic causes of autism. He, along with other scientists at IPAC, perform research in the public interest, aimed to find ways to reduce human suffering. His latest research has focused on the dangerous accumulation of aluminum from pediatric vaccines, as well as the discovery of chronic health issues associated with higher vaccine uptake. My hero. He has 17 years experience in biomedical research, serving primarily in the capacity of research, study, design, and analysis. His primary interests are in the development of prediction models of adverse outcomes of biological treatments, biomedical treatments, therapies, and bio, biologic prophylactics in the molecular and cellular basis of disease. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> he was the founder, founding editor-in-chief of the open access journal, Cancer Informatics. He has also served on the editorial board of numerous journals. His latest journal, Science, Public Health Policy, and the Law, brings forward views and analyses of the goodness of fit between public health and the medical practices and science. Woo, we need more men like you. <laughs> Dr. Lyons Weiler has also served as an expert witness in cases involving vaccine injury, and you can find his work, as I mentioned before, at IPAC. And if you text IPAC to 474747, you can get out your phones and do that right now. You can get um, his uh, information texted to you and get more involved in his organization. So he is here all the way from Pennsylvania and testified today at the Michigan House Oversight Committee hearing in support of HB 4667, which bans government vaccine passports. Please give Dr. James Lyonsweiler a warm Michigan welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a warm welcome. Uh, thank the pastor for your words of wisdom. You know, I've heard about the uh, Flat Earth Society. Uh, I'm a scientist, as you know. Did you hear I was a scientist? Uh, but the Flat Earth Society, uh, they, they, are, they, they, they have membership all around the globe. right? So, <laughs> This is, this is uh, a, a beautiful thing because I'm an evolutionary biologist by training and I find myself wanting to speak, I spoke for two hours here in this stage in this great house on science and I lead uh, discussions on the steps of state legislative, house, state legislative houses from coast to coast in the United States and I have people who are sworn Christians who say what, when I say, what do you want? They say, science, what do you want it now? Okay, so this is a remarkable because the anti-vax people are supposed to be anti-science. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the word hypothesis. You know what a hypothesis is? The reason why we have that word in our language is due to a philosopher of science called um, Karl Popper. Karl Popper, if you want to save science in the United States of America, read Karl Popper. He came out of pre-war Germany. As the Nazis were coming into power, there was a school of thought called the Vienna School, where the people in the Vienna School of the philosophy of science had determined that if they say something is true, then it must be so. That's called constructivism. That's called positivism. And in positivism, you go around and you collect all of the examples that fit your ideas. So if I were to say, let's say, all women wear blouses, okay? All I have to do is go and point to a woman that's wearing a blouse, or all men wear pants. There's a man wearing a pants. Well, I hope all men are wearing pants, I'll tell you right now. But the, point, <laughs> the point being, the point being, as long as I'm pointing to confirming instances, I'm in the right. But how many women 
wearing something other than a blouse does it take to falsify that claim? Amen. One. All I need, or all you need, if you don't think all women wear blouses, is to find a woman that doesn't wear a blouse. That's called testing the hypothesis, and it is a critical test of the hypothesis. And I'm here to tell you that the United States of America, government agencies like the CDC and the NIAID and the FDA and the EPA, they do not do science. That's right. They do constructivism. They make it up. They tell you it. And now they're trying to force it down your throats and make you believe it. So that is an answer to some of what, what a, a rejoinder of some of what you were talking about. Read Karl Popper. Now, what I came to talk to you tonight about was what's normal. I want to go on the record for historical purposes. I think it's very important that we put out video and talks on what normal is before people don't remember what normal is. Because they're trying to sell you a bill of goods called the new normal, which we would call the new abnormal. Okay? First, let's start with diagnosis. I'm not going to go into great detail, but I'm going to tell you that there has never been a time when you were given a diagnosis for a disease like COVID-19 on the basis of a molecular test such as the PCR test, and that if you have the positive PCR test result, you have the disease. Oh, what about, I don't have any symptoms. Well, you're asymptomatic. You're, you're asymptomatic, and by the way, stay home because it's asymptomatic transmission. You're going to kill people if you don't stay home. But then we have never had an illness where the primary first mode of care is, that is treatment, now that you have your diagnosis, go home and wait for 10 days to see if you get sick enough to go to the emergency room. That, how, that's not medical care. So it is abnormal to diagnose with a molecular test only. It is abnormal to send a patient away without treatment once you've given them a diagnosis. Okay? The approach to vaccination, to immunity, I can testify from, as an evolutionary biologist, that our immune systems have been evolving on the planet with viruses for hundreds of millions of years. It is one hundreds of millions of years normal for our immune system to fight off viruses and our ancestors' immune systems to fight off viruses with the innate immune system. With nitrous, uh, with, with nitric oxide and with peroxide and these things that you don't hear about. You hear about antibodies, but you don't hear about the rest of the immune system. It is normal for us to respond to a virus this way, and it is also normal for us to respond to a bacterium that's infected us with antibodies. That's the primary mode of response to, to bacteria, among others. We are tricking our immune systems into thinking that we're so sick with a viral infection that we have to mount a strong immune response, and that is bringing about autoimmunity. I published a paper in April 2020 that basically said, 20, April 2020, imagine that. We're just a few, couple of months into COVID, right? Here are all the parts of the proteins in the virus that are going to make you sick because of autoimmunity. Harvard Medical School validated my results in the lab. It is not normal to vaccinate for immunity. It is very strange to do that. And bad things can happen to the individual due to genetics you can have a genetic risk of vaccine injury, which we don't know about yet, because they don't allow that science. And it can happen at the population level, where, you know, what about, what about nuclear uh, power? You might be for nuclear power. I was talking with Bobby Kennedy a few couple of years ago, and I said, Bobby, on a planet where a species has developed nuclear power, let's say planet Earth and it's a human species, uh, what's the probability that you're going to have a problem with a nuclear power plant where it's a massive disaster? And he said the probability is 1.0. It's already happened. I said, exactly. We've got Fukushima. We've got Chernobyl. We've got Three Mile Island. Very, very serious, devastating consequences for 50,000 years. The hubris of our species to think that we can go down to the molecular level and harness the energy of the atom safely 
and the hubris of our species to continue to do nuclear power this way after we've already destroyed significant portions of the planet with nuclear meltdowns is stunning. 50,000 years. We, don't, we haven't had our civilization for 50,000 years. If you look at the archaeology, we, it is abnormal to do this. And then I said, okay, so what's the probability that they're going to release a vaccine that has devastating consequences to every person for the rest of their lives? He said, 1.0, the probability, it's coming. Okay? I already, I already told you what's normal about science. We test hypotheses. We challenge hypotheses. We don't say, you can't challenge my hypothesis. I overlord you. I'm the government. Don't, how dare you ask a question? I ask questions because I'm a scientist, and that's what they do. So how dare you challenge my ability to use freedom of speech in the United States to ask questions of you? I will never stop. How do you know when a politician is lying? Thank you. Their lips are moving. Right. But there's another answer to that. But they won't look you in the eye. And today, today I had the pleasure of watching politicians who were seated on a committee who refused to make eye contact with me when I was talking science. They're on the run. We've got them on the ropes. And they're playing defense. Thanks to you. Why? Thanks to you. It is not normal for a government to tell the entire population, we have the answer for your health, and you are all cookie cutters of each other. And if you don't fit our public health and you get sick because of it, we're going to tell you, you didn't get sick because of our public health. God bless genetic variation. <laughs> we're different. We're different from our parents, thank God. <laughs> our children are different from us, okay? There's mutations that happen and they make us a little bit more susceptible or less susceptible to disease, unless it's vaccines, and then we're all cookie cutter clones of each other. We're not a herd of animals. It is abnormal for public health to dictate health. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Top-down health doesn't work. What we need are doctors on the ground that talk to you and say, what are you feeling? What are you experiencing? And they make notes and they go to conferences and then they say, hey, I saw the same thing in mine. And so ground Grassroots level medicine should flow, the information needs to flow upwards, not top down dictate thou shalt. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Family, extremely important to everyone in this room, I'm sure. What is normal for the record for family is to visit your grandparents. Yes. It's yes. normal to visit your aunts and uncles and for cousins to get together and spend time and relate. It is normal to celebrate holidays. How dare they step on the sacred holidays of Christian religion or any other religion and say, you can't gather for that. If this event were taking place in the socialist state of Canada, there would be 200 policemen out the door, or women, waiting to arrest each and every one of them, because that's what they do in Canada. That's right. Okay? Funerals, the sacred moment of saying goodbye. That's normal. Getting together, comparing notes, sitting in the background, crying, or going up to the casket and say, wow, he looks really good. <laughs> That's normal. Okay? That's normal. Okay? Marriage ceremonies, normal. How many marriages have been saved because a man and a wife stood next to each other? They've been married for 40 years. They fought all that morning, they fought all the way to the church, they fought walking into this church, they didn't talk to each other, they didn't even want to sit next to each other. But silently, they renewed their vows during the marriage ceremony. We have to congregate and renew ourselves through social interactions. These traditions that the government wants to, to end, they want to end it because it empowers the human spirit. Schools, that's where children learn. They don't just learn reading, writing, arithmetic. They learn how to work in groups. They learn how to problem solve. They learn what it means to be part of a group or not to be part of a group. You make your mistakes as children. You're an outcast in this group, so you make your mistake. And that's, everybody apologizes later on. And 
everybody forgives. This is beautiful. This is normal. If your kid can't go to school, how can they make mistakes and learn? So important. It's so normal. Summer camps. Gotta get away from the kids. It's not normal. Okay? Gotta get away from mom and dad. Please, can I go to summer camp? Okay? These are the things that are healthy and normal. The sacred moment of convalescence. The elderly in our population who have to die alone or want to die because they're alone. Because of COVID-19 isolation. Utterly unacceptable. Amen. The government is, thank you, pleasant. The government is stopping rites of passage. Future sociologists will have a field day over the generation gap that has that is emerging between people that were pre-COVID and people that were post-COVID. The very social structures of our society are being threatened. The ones that you know of. Who's on top? Who's in control? Did this die? No. Okay. The psychological and social development of our children from the age of one until they're 26 and beyond. The point is, disruption of social gatherings will have a massive effect psychologically on the population. There, it shuts down the opportunity for information sharing, like we're doing tonight, great event, okay? But it also alters the way that people learn about individuality. The individuality is an important part of what you all believe in, individual rights. But it's also important to know that you need to just get away from people for a while. You need some, so some, some me time, some self time. These are normal things that people experience in a large society. That loss of concept of individuality means they are going to turn to an authority to tell them what to do because they never learn how to solve problems in a group. This will massively empower the government to just simply dictate, and I chose that word carefully, dictate to you, your offspring, your children, and their children for eons what they should think, what they should act, how they should act, what they should eat, what medicines they must consume. This leads to government compliance. Government compliance is important if there's a red light and you should stop your car. It's important for you, and it's important for other people on the road. Government compliance is based on a social contract of trust, where you trust that the rules that are in place are there for all the right reasons, and you agree with them for the most part. Yeah, okay, I have a couple speeding tickets I really didn't agree with. You know, okay? <laughs> Let's not talk about that, right? But an important one is patient privacy. Who here knows that they suspended HIPAA due to COVID? that your employer can actually tell everybody in the workplace, they can tell the press, they can tell the police whether you have COVID. And because it's things related to COVID, it's arguable that they're gonna extend it to the vaccine. Your, right now, that's the federal law. Your patient privacy is under attack. So the last thing that I have to say is when you feel lonely, when you feel lost, and when you feel that there's nothing else that you can do, go to jameslionsweiler.com and read some science. Because I've got your back. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here.
naked face. <laughs> so I told you uh, my, my children are vaccine injured. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. As a speech pathologist, I knew autism as an autism specialist. And uh, I served severe to profound children. Children that were so severe they couldn't be in a special program for autism or a school. All of their treatment needed to be home. These families were absolutely devastated um, and consumed. I mean, these are parents that couldn't find caregivers because their children were biting and screaming and headbanging and feces on the walls. So I knew autism, and uh, this was back in the 1990s, and working in the home with these families, and the same story was told over and over again. My child was perfectly normal, and then I gave him the shots, and then I lost him. I watched my beautiful child disappear. And back then it was, um, primarily I'd heard about the MMR. It was consistently the MMR shot. Parents at that time were screaming from the rooftops that the MMR had destroyed their child. This was back in the 1990s. You guys remember Jenny McCarthy? She went on this huge press conference. Her son had regressed into autism. And uh, at the time, the press was picking up on it. You know, she was on Donahue. She was on Oprah. She was on CNN. You wouldn't get that anymore now, would you? And uh, parents were speaking up. At, before the 1990s, autism was 1 in 10,000. Most people had no idea what autism was. And then in the 1990s, it went to 1 in 500. And it was at that time that the CDC started doing a few of their own trials trying to get to the bottom of it. And there was a doctor at the CDC, his name, he's actually still there, Dr. William Thompson. And he was commissioned to do a study on the MMR. And they published that study in 2005 and basically said there was no connection between the MMR and autism. And we have been hearing the CDC say this for what has it been? 15 years? I mean, forever, they've been saying it. Over and over. It's the most, they say it's the most studied thing, that there is no direct link to autism and vaccines. And they use vaccines plural, even though they've only studied the MMR. Well, Dr. William Thompson, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, over a decade ago, was secretly recorded on a phone with his colleague, Dr. Brian Hooker, who was a doctor whose child had regressed into autism. And Dr. William Thompson was confessing his soul, I am so sorry. I have so much regret and remorse of what we did back in that MMR study in 2005. We buried the science. We found there was a 336% chance of autism in the African-American boys if they received that MMR shot before the age of three. And I was told, and my entire team was told, to destroy the evidence. 2005. How many African-American boys since 2005 have been permanently damaged by the neglect and the absolute corruption of the CDC. It is absolutely criminal and they should all be charged for their crimes against humanity. Amen. So Dr. Brian Hooker had that, video, that recording, praise him. And uh, Dr. William Thompson had to file for whistleblower status at the CDC and he, because he kind of figured that if I take all this evidence away, I might get in trouble one day. So he turned in 800 pages of his study that was supposed to be destroyed and turned it into Congress to Congressman Bill Posey. 
in 2014. Anybody heard about this? 2014. Bill Posey cannot get his colleagues to hold a hearing against the CDC to subpoena Dr. William Thompson to this day. Who's ready to write some letters and make some phone calls? Is it finally time to hold the CDC accountable and have a hearing in Congress? I say so. Not only that, there's another whistleblower. His name is Dr. Andrew Zimmerman. He has now turned in his affidavit to Congress saying that he was the top scientist, the top doctor for the nation for the vaccine injury court. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but you cannot sue a vaccine manufacturer. Vaccine manufacturers are not liable for the injuries their products cause. We, the people, pay for those injuries. And then when we get hurt or our children are devastated or killed, we must submit to the vaccine injury court and hope and pray against the government's defense that we get any kind of payment. The maximum payment being $250,000 for death. Dr. Zimmerman was the state's expert witness, doctor witness for the vaccine injury court. And he was the one that said, vaccines don't cause autism. They loved him. Vaccines don't cause autism. He was the guy. He was the expert. They used it. They had 5,000 families that were lined up for this court to get their payment or to get justice for the destroyed child that had regressed into autism. Dr. Zimmerman, amazingly, God works in amazing ways. His colleague, another physician, his daughter regressed into autism after vaccination. How about that? Hmm. And Dr. Zimmerman, her name was Anna Poling, very famous now case. They, they were um, uh, court silenced because of their suit. They, they settled out of court and got a good settlement, but they were silenced. They weren't allowed to report what had happened. Um, but Anna Poling had regressed into autism and Dr. Zimmerman and Hannah's father started testing Hannah to see what exactly biologically happened to Hannah that made her regress into autism. And they found it. They found that Hannah had a mitochondrial disorder that nobody had noticed, nobody had diagnosed. She had a hidden mitochondrial disorder, made her more susceptible to vaccine injury. Bing! Dr. Zimmerman realized that his testimony no longer applied. And he called the lawyers at the vaccine court and he said, hey guys, I hate to tell you, but I found a connection to vaccines and autism. I think it's time for us to start considering this and those 5,000 families that are lined up, that they should really be looking at genetic things and mitochondrial disorders, that there are specific things that can cause these children to regress into autism. Do you know what the court did? Fired him. They fired him, but they continued to use his testimony from prior court cases in all the future cases after. Complete fraud in the court. And Dr. Zimmerman has now signed an affidavit that they have misrepresented him, represented him in all of those cases. Once again, Congress, step up, do your job, subpoena these doctors, subpoena the CDC, and let's get back to true health and true representation to the people and find out what's going on with our vaccine program. I was gonna tell you my story, but that's an even better story. I'll leave that for later. My children who are here in the front being patient. Okay, I said enough. My dear friend, Dr. Christina Parks. She received her PhD in cellular and molecular biology from the University of Michigan in 1999. 
She did her graduate research in the field of cytokine signaling. Cytokines are the chemicals that the immune system uses to communicate. Thus, Dr. Parts brings a wealth of knowledge about the molecular mechanisms by which vaccines may be causing vaccine, uh, causing injury to vulnerable immune systems. Dr. Parks has been in the spotlight recently for her outspoken resistance to the racial bias narrative being pushed by Governor Whitmer's uh, office and her executive branch. That's pretty good, right? We need those counter voices. Instead, she advocates for doctors to focus on known epigenetic differences in African-American populations that are causing them to be more vulnerable to COVID-19 and for doctors to treat patients accordingly. Dr. Parks is a passionate advocate for scientific and medical freedom. She's lambasted the media for their, cons their concerted misinformation campaign regarding hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, and it's used to prevent and treat COVID-19, as well as for their silencing of doctors and scientists who have dared to tell the truth. Dr. Parks has been closely following the science around the world in the origin of COVID, as well as on the development of these fast-tracked COVID treatments and vaccines, they call them vaccines. Tonight, I am thrilled she is joining us once again. Please welcome Dr. Christine Park. I'm used to yelling, I'm a teacher. So Winston Churchill is credited with saying that um, men stumble across the truth all the time. Unfortunately, they usually dust themselves off and hurry on. Right, do any of you feel like you've handed your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers the truth, and as they walk away from you, they dump it in the waistband yes. and keep walking? Yes. All right. We must get the truth out, because in a time of tyranny, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. So today, I'm here to enlist your help in getting the truth out there. I cannot be all things to all people, and we all must stand for truth. There can't be any excuses. I don't know the science. I'm too busy. We all can stand for the truth. Um, Dr. Jack talked about this new religion of scientism. Uh, there's a reason why I decided not to be a researcher, because I did not feel that we were humble before God's creation. And it bothered me deeply in my soul. I love science. I love God's creation. I love knowing more and more about God's creation, but I feel that we should always be humble before it. And it grieves me deeply to see people who consider themselves fellow Christians who worship man rather than God. Because that's what this worship of scientism is. They don't even worship science because they don't know the science. When you start engaging them about the science, it's very clear they have no idea what they're talking about. And because, you know, most scientists, if you've spent eight years trying to get a PhD, I, uh, as a side note, I had a, an undergrad working under me. And I would do these blots, and, and the people next to me would do these, uh, this other lab would do these blots, and they were beautiful Western blots, none of you know what that means. But a, a beautiful um, representation of what was supposed to happen. And my undergrad would do it, and there'd be, it, it looked like my shirt, actually. And a Western <laughs> blot isn't supposed to look at my shirt. It's supposed to have clear little lines, right? Discrete lines, not stuff. And he said, what am I doing wrong? And I said, I don't know, just, just keep doing it, and eventually it will work itself out. Um, but the point being that scientists can be humbled by science. You're humbled by what you don't know. You're humbled by how hard it is to make it work. You're humbled by how hard it is to ask a good question and get a good answer. And so you won't find most scientists actually being very arrogant. In fact. I am constantly shocked at how arrogant people who know very little are towards me. It, it, my colleagues would have never treated me that way. In fact, they would treat me like an actual human being with a brain that can make my own decisions. Right? Whereas I find many people, or first they tell me I don't have a PhD. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, have you seen the little meme with Stephen King online? 
where the guy's asking him if he's even read the book. <laughs> it's those kind of conversations where you're like, okay. Um, they're telling me that this isn't really science. Peer-reviewed research isn't really science. Um, and so we're not worshiping science at all. We're worshiping the idea that man is the measure of all things. And once you start worshiping the idea that man is the measure of all things, and we do not need to be humble before God's creation, it doesn't really matter whether you're even looking at the real science or you're just looking at what someone told you was the science. Because you're having faith in men and men's ideas. And so does it even matter then if the men's ideas are true or right or good or beautiful or that it just came from some man who thinks that he's good and right and true and beautiful? Like Fauci or Bill Gates. Right? <laughs> Maybe they'll get married now that Bill Gates is married. <laughs> so my question to you is how many of you are ready to stand for the truth. Are ready to look at the truth. And it's painful what we have done to our children, to our society by um, turning our backs on the truth is very painful. So I want to enlist you all in helping to counter this narrative because it's going to take all of us. One of us is not enough. And so specifically with the vaccine passports, I've got three major points that I'm going to try to touch on, that uh, questions that you need to ask. So I'm like anyone else, I want to deluge people with information and just show them um, everything that they didn't know. But many people, that those that have dusted themselves off, right, they've thrown truth in the wastebasket already. They had a chance to look at it, they don't want to. So how can you make them engage with the truth? And one way that I found is by asking them a question because it forces them to reflect. They can't just push you away. They have to ask themselves a question. Does the virus prevent transmission? Okay, so we don't have to push our knowledge in their face. Does it prevent transmission? Because I just heard Dr. Fauci say that they weren't sure yet and that's why we have to continue wearing masks and social distancing like little good children. Right? Does it prevent transmission? Well, here's how they did the studies. My understanding is the COVID and I mean the Moderna and the Pfizer um, trials were very similar. They took 30,000 placebo and they only did the placebo because we have a large vaccine skeptic um, audience that said, hey, where's your placebo? And they're like, oh, I know. Okay. <laughs> So we have 30,000 with placebo and 30,000 that were va vaccinated. No, 15,000 with placebo, 15,000 that were vaccinated. And they said, okay, well, this vaccine is 95% effective. As a scientist, I'm like, 95% effective at what? I'm not even sure they told me yet. I'm not even sure what it means. What does it mean, 95% effective? And then they supposed them all to the virus to see if it prevented it, right? No, you can't do that. It's not ethical in humans. You should have done that in the animal trials, and they didn't have time or energy to do the animal trials with the billions that we gave them. So they didn't do those studies. And so with humans, we can't expose them to the virus, so they just waited to see who got COVID. Did they test them every three days to see if they got COVID like they do our, our athletes? No, they only tested them if they showed symptoms, and they went to their doctor, and the doctor suggested a test. All right? So how many people tested positive for coronavirus out of 30,000? Under 200, All right? About 185 in the control group and maybe 11 to 16, depending on which trial, in the vaccinated group. And so then they said 95% effective, see less got, you know, were in the vaccinated group than in the control group. But I said, well, wait a minute, I'm a scientist. I know I'm not very bright, but like, don't the symptoms of the vaccine kind of mimic coronavirus? How do you know that you didn't have coronavirus and it was a vaccine, or how do you know it was the vaccine and not the coronavirus? Well, seven days after the first dose, they didn't bother to test anybody. And then seven days after the second dose. And then if you thought you had coronavirus symptoms, you called your doctor, you didn't run in and get a test. You called your doctor and they said, well, is your arm sore? And you said, yes, and they said, ah, all right, so this kind of terrible science 
is what they are using to tell us that this is 95% effective. Right? This is experimental gene therapy. So that brings me to the second question. The first is, you need to keep asking, does this prevent transmission? Do not let up. Because if it doesn't prevent transmission, why am I getting it to help somebody else? You know, if, we're, if everybody needs to get it for their own health, well, let's force vegetables on everybody. Brussels sprouts are great for your health. All right, the second question is, is it wise to inject everyone in America with a new technology that is basically gene therapy? My first comment when I saw this new uh, vaccine was, that's gene therapy. By that, I don't mean it's altering your genes. What I mean is it was designed to replace an injured, defective gene in people. And so if you had a defective, it, it was... Um, pioneered with CFTR, with cystofibrosis at University of Michigan when I was there in the 90s. And what happened, they tried to get the gene into the lungs of kids with cystic fibrosis or adults with cystic fibrosis by putting it in a cold virus and having the lungs express that protein, the good protein, and they got anaphylaxis and died. Oops. So they said, let's lose a liposomal system like Moderna and Pfizer. And they tried getting the gene in and they got anaphylaxis. And so they said, the problem is we need to get so much of this mRNA in to replace the gene, it's just not working. When we try to use it with that much, we get anaphylaxis. So apparently, I lost track of the story after that, but apparently they thought, we don't need to get as much in with the vaccine, so let's use it for that. So this is gene therapy, where it's been tried in vaccines. I know of no vaccine that has been approved with this technology. So we're going from zero to give it to everyone. I had someone message me and they said, you know, I, I, I have COVID, frontline doctors prescribed me some ivermectin, I'm gonna go get it. But my sister says, don't take that, it's, it's, it's not safe, it has deadly side effects. <laughs> and I said, yes, it's FDA approved for safety, it has been for decades, it's been used since the late 80s um, for, for parasites and for river blindness and for many other things. In fact, it's on the WHO's most, um, uh, necessary medications, okay? So it's like, no, no, don't take ivermectin, a safe wormer, but experimental gene therapy, bring it on, right? I just don't know what kind of crazy world I'm living in. So we must ask, is it really a good idea to give our children an injection of gene therapy, experimental gene therapy, that has never been tested for its ability to promote cancer or cause problems with fertility? Right, the next one is, isn't natural immunity better? Duh. Right, why are we saying everybody has to get a vaccine passport? You wondered why they didn't ask you to have your antibodies taken at the doctor? Well, they don't want you to have your antibodies taken because they want you to get the vaccine for whatever nefarious reasons, which um, Dr. Wolf, I'm sure, will, will highlight. And so, um, we need to understand that natural immunity is better. You make antibodies, I think they said, Dr. Jack said, that I think there's 40 different epitopes on this virus. So you're gonna make 40 different kind of antibodies. Do you think all 40 of those epitopes are gonna mutate when the virus comes back around next season? No, most likely not. And so when you see that new virus, even if three or four of them mutate, you're still going to be able to fight it off. How many epitopes are on the spike protein? Five. All right, is it much more likely that you're gonna have one where the spike protein mutated and several or all five of those are mutated? Yes. All right, so natural immunity is stronger, it lasts longer, our immune systems are complex, right? They're just looking at antibodies. You have a T cell response, you have innate immunity, there are many ways that your body builds durable immunity. Do not let them lie to you, all right? And if you get this, um, Vaccine, after you've had the virus, there are certain risks with that. That's not necessarily safe and it can be very problematic. In fact, now they're screening and saying, hey, within 90 days of having the virus, you shouldn't be getting the vaccine. Well, why do I need the vaccine at all, right? So these are your talking points. Does it prevent transmission? It is it wise to exper um, inject everyone in the US with experimental gene therapy. And isn't natural immunity better? Start asking questions. Thank you very much.
Isn't she amazing? I put her to work a lot. She does a lot of work. She does a lot of education. Um, yeah, so if you get a chance, an opportunity to listen to Dr. Parks put on some of her amazing PowerPoint presentations. She's a wealth of information and science and just empowers us to really understand what's going on because we don't get a lot of truth around here, do we?